Hi everyone, welcome to episode 9 of Morning Matcha. I'm here today with Tracy Ryan, the CEO of Canna Kids and the owner of SavingSophie.org. So hi Tracy, hi. thanks for joining us. Um, I found out about you because I was invited to the 420 Games. Ah. And w- with just obviously another company I was going to run and then I ended up just walking around instead. I was so intrigued by all the booths and you weren't at your booth, but I was just so interested in what's going on with Canna Kids. Mm-hmm. So I'm really glad we got in touch. And I was, let's start with you telling us a little bit about Canna Kids and sure. how you started the foundation and why. Sure. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It's beautiful here. I'm excited mm-hmm. to be in Laguna. Um, my daughter, Sophie, was diagnosed with a brain tumor when she was eight and a half months old. It's called a, a low-grade glioma. What that means is that it's a, it's a high survival rate, but with these types of tumors, it's a very, very high recurrence rate as well. Now, with most tumors, if you have a relapse, then the chance of survival goes way down. These are different by nature. It's a grade one. So if there's a relapse, she still has a long survival rate. It just means this tumor's pesky, and we're going to be in it much more you know, for the long haul. And the, and the issue is, is that the younger the child is diagnosed, the higher the likelihood of them being on the high end of that recurrence rate. My daughter was diagnosed at eight and a half months. You don't get much younger than that with a diagnosis. So it was really interesting how the whole thing kind of transpired because within, um, I'd say, uh, five to seven days of Sophie being diagnosed, I started a Facebook page for her called Prayers for Sophie, which now has got over 46,000 followers. Uh, she has an Instagram of the same name. Mm-hmm. It's got you know, about 17. And it was, you know, one of those things that I wanted to do because I believe in the power of prayer. And I thought that if I could get as many people as possible wishing her well, that's just that much more good energy in the world for my daughter. And she really needed all the help that she could get. What I didn't know was what that was going to lead me to. So through a chain of events on social media, we got connected to Ricky Lake of Film and Television and Abby Epstein, who is her producing partner. And these women make incredible documentaries. You may have heard of one of them called The Business of Being Born mm-hmm. about natural natural childbirth for mothers. And little to, did I know, but they had just started filming their another documentary now titled Weed the People about using cannabis oil for pediatric disease. And it was really quite serendipitous because at this point we'd been contacted by about 20 people through social media from overseas because my husband's old roommate lived over there. He told all his friends about what was going on with Sophie. You know, the the uh, other side of the world, if you will, is much more progressive when it comes to cannabis, yeah. depending on the country that you're in. And they'd already been using it for patients there. And we really weren't talking about this here four years ago. Mm-hmm. So we thought they were all stoned. And we're like, how could this plant be used for children for cancer? It's what you use to get high, you know, when you're out at the club or Mm -hmm. partying with friends or what have you. There's no way I'm going to give my kid weed. And I didn't even, like, think to myself how there could be another form other than blowing joint smoke in our face. Mm -hmm. So I immediately wrote it off. Well, when Ricky and Abby were introduced to us, I'm just like, wow, you know, this keeps getting presented to us. I trust these women. I actually tried for a natural childbirth with my own daughter after watching their movie. Wow. Even met uh, Abby when Sophie was six months old in my belly because I volunteered at a pregnancy awareness event and and the panel of, of uh, the business of being born was there. Oh I literally paparazzi stalked her, <laughs> waited outside of the conference room to meet her mm-hmm. and shook her hand and thanked her for helping me make my birthing decisions. And now here this woman was again in my life a year later saying, let me help you with your child and cannabis. And so we started doing our own research. Abby and Ricky surrounded us with people who knew how to dose. They didn't know how to dose for kids because they'd never dosed a child that young before. But they had a lot of experience dosing mostly elderly people, but, you know, eight people older than than pediatric age. And we all took our best shot at it. And we uh, started cannabis, Sophie on cannabis at nine months old on camera. Wow. And this movie has been following us ever since. And it's actually, we just shot our final scene the other day at Sophie's dance recital. 
And the movie should be coming out to film festivals later this year. I'm so excited to see it's, it. Oh, God. I'm so excited. We've been doing this for four years. I'm ready to see it. And <laughs> I, I've seen, you know, the different trailers that they've done. And these women are incredible and in how they edit and how they storytell. And they've they've flown around the world and interviewed some of the foremost leading scientists, doctors, experts. They followed me to Israel when I took Sophie's brain tumor sample there for research studies. Wow. And they've really captured just so much of it. So we're very excited for the world to see our story unfold on film. So that's how we got introduced. Mm -hmm. When we saw what was happening with our own child by giving her cannabis, and when we saw a tumor that really isn't supposed to shrink with chemotherapy, it's meant more to stabilize the tumor. Because mm -hmm. with slow, slow growing tumors, the, cell the cells divide slowly. Chemo only gobbles up the cells when they're dividing. So if the chemo isn't in the bloodstream at the exact same time that those cells are dividing, it doesn't it doesn't make it smaller. It just keeps it where it is. It stabilizes oh. it. So n nothing new is is kicking up. But when we started seeing this tumor get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, scan after scan after scan, and we went from a diagnosis of Sophie going blind, which is what her neurologist said. He said, look, you know, her left eye, there's no chance of saving it. It's 100% going to be blind. Her right eye, best case scenario, is going to be minimally compromised, uh, or it's going to be um, um, horrifically compromised with minimal vision as a best case scenario. And he told us to prepare ourselves for full blindness. And to see this tumor get smaller and to see her vision be saved, this was like, okay, you know, this is a secret that mm -hmm. we can't keep anymore. We can't watch our daughter do this well and not let other people know about it. Yeah. So I had already created uh, a Facebook page alongside some other incredible mothers who had sick children on social media. That was a secret page called Canna Kids. And we'd already started to kind of build up this community where we were all supporting each other and bringing in experts, bringing in growers, bringing in people who understood terpene pro profiles and dosing to support each other. So I'd already started that with these women. And I, I, you know, looked at my husband and I looked at my child and I looked at what was happening around us. And I was like, you know, I, th I really think God put us on this earth for this mission. I think that Sophie has a message. I think we're her messengers and I think it's time to get the message out. So we went public. That's so powerful. It yeah. was, you know, it's one of those things where when you're, you're infant, is diagnosed with cancer, you can go one of two ways. You can go down the dark hole mm -hmm. and you can crawl up and die inside, yeah. which is what we initially did. Or you can stand up and fight and you can do everything in your power that you can to educate yourself, become the, the best advocate for your child that you can. Because look, it's a cattle call in these hospitals. And unfortunately, we're not at a place right now where these hospitals are picking up these individualized, personalized medicine approaches where they can test for what mutations are in that specific cancer and therefore give that child the medicine that will work best first. Mm -hmm. They have a first line of defense and it's the same for every kid, regardless of whether, you know, just because they have the same diagnosis does not mean that they have the same driving mutations in their tumor. So one medicine that will work for one child will fail another, even mm -hmm. if it's the same diagnosis, because genetically we're all different just as our cancers are. So we're not at that place right now. So you really have to, if you're going to go in and you're going to help make sure your child gets the best care possible, you have to be educated. There's yeah. just no way around it because there's a lot of incredible doctors out there. There's a lot of doctors that aren't so great. Mm -hmm. And you can't always trust your doctor, even though you should always go to a doctor. You should always use Western medicine until there's more research so we understand what medicine needs to be used for what disease and what mutation and so forth and so on. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. In the meantime, you have to know all sides of the fence. You have to understand what that chemo could potentially do to your child. You have to understand what the long-term side effects of that could be and how to protect their body to help potentially negate those issues. And mm -hmm. that's what we did. We just really dedicated ourselves to our child and to our mission and now to other families around the world. And it has been this incredible experience. Um, starting Canna Kids, we've, we've been around for about three years now. The first year we grew. Uh, the last two years, we've treated now almost a 1,000 patients. Wow. And we're a small company, but we're growing and getting bigger. So that 1,000 is going to become 5,000 soon, and then that's going to become 10,000 and 20 and so on and so forth. And uh, it's it's just been this really, really great ride. You know, we've now got a full product line in the market. We've got THC products. We've got CBD products. We've got THCA products, which are an, it's another non-psychoactive version of mm -hmm. THC. We've got a pain lotion coming out that was designed by 
Merck and Amgen scientists, which are huge pharmaceutical companies. These guys all, they don't work there now, but they did for 20, 30 years. They helped build some of these big pharma companies. They're brilliant scientists. They're now focused on cannabinoid medicines that have that helped us build uh, this new pain topical we have coming out for Incredible. severe pain. And, and we just keep going. And mm -hmm. now we're getting into research, which is very exciting. So, okay, that's so much is going on. So and that much. is incredible, <laughs> all the work that you've done. And I just kind of want to go back to um, the, and then move forward from there and talk more about the products and everything. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the day you were told the information about mm -hmm. Sophie. And you're, I mean, it must have been such an emotionally charged situation for yeah. you and your husband. Mm -hmm. So what did you do that moment that you heard mm -hmm. that information and when you went home because you were told that she needed to go through chemo, right? Yeah. And she obviously did. You made the decision to go through it. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? This is always a bit of a emotional conversation for me to have yeah. because every time that I tell it, I relive it in my head and yeah. I kind of go through those moments again. So apologies if I get no, a little I'm bit sorry misty. for bringing that up for um, you. Because it was a hard day. Yeah. And I will never forget the day. I mean, it was, it, it feels like in, in my mind, I'm in the room right now as we're speaking. Yeah. And Sophie was in this tiny little high chair seat and I was feeding her avocado and pureed baby food that I'd made for her from scratch while we waited for my sister, and my brother-in-law to show up because we were all going to go to the Grove that day and have this beautiful day. Oh. And, um, you know, we weren't really worried about what the MRI was going to be, you know, jumping back a few days, her, her eyeball started shaking initially, which is what cued us into something being up potentially. Um, it's called nystagmus. And a lot of times kids just have this shaking and it resolves itself because it's the brain developing. How long was it shaking? Like just how could like you a, a week. Oh, before we took her, yeah, before we took her yeah. into her first doctor's appointment mm -hmm. that previous Monday. So everything that happened to us happened to us in seven days. Wow. So uh, one week prior is when the eye started shaking and I reached out to my mommy community and was like, you know, I was big into Facebook mommy groups. Yeah. I, I, I always say I took myself to Harvard baby college when <laughs> I got pregnant with my kid because I just I like to educate myself. Yeah. And um, I, I hit my mommy group and um, I was like, you know, I, I believe it was in Lil Mamas or L.A. Mommies. I'm in very active in both of those communities, wonderful communities. And uh, I asked him, I was like, have you guys ever had any of this? This happened to your kid. Their eyeballs start shaking. And and a few of them have been like, yeah, I think I think my little one did. But, you know, you should just go get it checked out. So. That Monday, we got Sophie in to see her pediatrician. By Tuesday, she was seeing ophthalmologist. By Wednesday, she was seeing a neurologist. And the neurologist is like, yeah, the chances of this being anything, you're like finding a needle in a haystack. So we'll put a scan on the books for 30 days out. And we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, the ophthalmologist was a new mom that we had seen on that Tuesday. And she had a brand new baby. And there's something about a mother's intuition that's really quite powerful and quite mm -hmm. real. And she had this instinct that told her that this wasn't just brain development, that there was something more going on with our child. There wasn't a reason why she thought that she wasn't seeing anything with her optic nerves or, or, you know, and it's something that she'd seen before that they ruled out as no big deal. But for some reason, she thought that there was something up with my kid. I just got the chills. Yeah. A lot of the, I, I've, I've covered in chills pretty much every day yeah. of my life since this all started. It's one thing after another. Yeah. So this wonderful, caring woman continued to harass the MRI scheduler. And, and she was like, look, this is an eight and a half month old. We're not going to play with this kid's life. There's no way she's waiting 30 days. I think that there's something more going on here. She needs to be in that scanner. So by, we got a call on Thursday, the only day we didn't have a doctor's appointment and they called up and they said, Mr. And Mrs. Ryan, we have an appointment that just became available. We had a cancellation at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow. Can you be here? We're just like, oh my God, 6.30 in the morning? <laughs> we're not morning people at all, but we're like, this is our kid. We'll do mm -hmm. whatever it takes. So we got up at like 5 a.m. to get ready and take her daughter there. And we were terrified because this was something that they were gonna have to put her under anesthesia for. And they were gonna have to put a tube in her throat to keep her airway open. And, you know, she's a newborn, essentially. I mean, ain't not a newborn, but close enough. Yeah. Um, and the pediatrician, there was a, a, a man there that we became close to over the years at Kaiser. Uh, unfortunately, he lost his child not long after. So we really kind of bonded over mm -hmm. the tragedies as our journey evolved, the, the tragedies that we were, were both kind of going through. And uh, but, but that day he reassured us. He's like, look, you guys, again, you know, 
just like what your neurologist said, it's like a needle in a haystack. The chance of this being anything is so rare. You really don't need to worry. So uh, we didn't. We worried more about the MRI. And we're like, a, you know, total mess in the waiting room. We're crying. And it's like looking back at it now, it's kind of ridiculous how upset we were <laughs> because we've now been through over 20 MRIs. And it's just like, well, she'll be fine. It's, it's you know, Tylenols is, is usually more prone to causing issues than anesthesia is. Um, so, you know, we, we went on about our day and took her home and she did great. And the next morning we're sitting there and she's eating her baby food and we're waiting on Crystal and Arda, my sister and my brother-in-law. And I remember they were stuck in LA marathon traffic and they were running late mm. and the phone rang and it was from an unknown number. And Kaiser was the only people that called me from unknown numbers. And I knew immediately it was Kaiser for whatever reason. I mean, you know, people get unknown numbers mm -hmm. all the time, but I knew it was Kaiser. I was like, this is weird. Why is the hospital calling me today? And I picked up the phone and it was her pediatrician. And uh, he said, uh, Mrs. Ryan, he goes, I have something to tell you. He goes, we got Sophie's scan results back. And, and what I'm about to tell you is going to change your family's life forever. And I just want you to know I'm very sorry. And I was like, he's like, but we found something in Sophie's brain. And it was then and there that my world just stopped. It was like, you know, you see those movies where time stands still. Mm -hmm. and you're the only thing that's moving that's that's how I felt I felt like the world had stopped and I was the only thing that was moving and what I said to him was is my daughter gonna die and that was literally like the first thing that came out of my mouth mm -hmm. saying I told you this is a hard conversation for me to I have. Know, like <laughs> and um and he said you know we think she'll be okay he's like uh, unfortunately I've had to google search this disease because wow. I've never even heard of it. That's how rare it is. And uh, Sophie ended up being that needle in the haystack. And he said, you know, what I found online is that um, there is a high survival rate for this, but the only option for her is chemo at her young age. And it's an inoperable tumor. It's, it's an astrocytoma and they are like spider webs. They're not like solid tumors. So they literally create these spider webs and wrap around the optic nerves. That's why it's called an optic pathway glioma wow. because it wraps around those optic nerves and then grows out into the brain as it continues to, to grow. So, so you, it's not like you can go in there and you can get rid of it. So yeah. chemo is not supposed to shrink it. Uh, you can't operate on it. So you have to hope that you can stop it and keep it from causing detrimental damage, hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain, uh, complete blindness, which is what happens in a lot of these kids. And, and my daughter's having some vision issues right now just started happening we have no idea why there's no correlation with what's going on with the tumor but that's unfortunately also how these behave you um you know you can you can come you can get a tumor to go a little bit smaller and the vision can get worse the tumor can grow and it can um get better now if you get rid of the whole tumor of course it's gonna the vision's gonna be great which is mm -hmm. what we did the, those first first 13 months we shrank it by like 85 to 90 percent and so, of course, it was relieving that uh, those issues with the nerves. But she's had some ups and downs with her tumors. Her tumor is aggressive for a low-grade, non-aggressive tumor. Yeah. And we've had to try a few different protocols with her. But fortunately, you would meet my kid today, and you would never know there's anything wrong with her. It has, it has created these amazing miracles in her body mm -hmm. um, that no one can really explain except for scientists who understand what cannabis can do. Mm -hmm. But after, you know, going back to that day, um, you know, my brother and sister show up and, and we're calling our parents and we're just, you know, we, we felt like someone had just been murdered. Honestly, yeah. it was like going through a death and trying to figure out how we're going to plan the funeral, knowing our knowing and believing our child wasn't going to die. That was still those same kind mm -hmm. of emotions, that same mm -hmm. kind of hurt and pain. And it's really the only way I know how to describe it. Cause most people haven't ever had a child diagnosed with cancer, but everybody has had someone die. Yeah. So it's the only kind of emotion that I feel I can share with somebody and then really relate to mm -hmm. me on that level. If they haven't been through what we've been through. So, you know, we, 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 by Monday morning, we're in the oncology ward, um, you know, seven days to the day when she first started seeing her doctors and I was looking at other cancer patients hooked up, you know, with, with needles in their chest, getting pumped full of poison. And unfortunately, the first day that I was there, there was a woman that had a pediatric tumor, but she was in her 20s and I'd never seen somebody so close to death. And that was the first visual that I saw work walking into a pediatric oncology ward was this skin and bone woman with no hair, hollowed eyes, dark circles, slumped over in her chair, 
uh, covered in a blanket because she's freezing from the medicine, mm -hmm. you know, causing reactions in her body. And it was just, I mean, I, I, there wasn't, I don't think there was three minutes in that whole conversation with her doctors where I wasn't crying. Like they were just holding my hand the whole time and trying to like coach me through it because, you know, my whole life, I just wanted to be a mom. Yeah. That's all I ever wanted to be was a mom. And then to have such a perfect pregnancy and to do everything right and to, you know, train myself on how to be the best mother I could be. And for this to be like that, that goal for me, that one thing that I needed to accomplish to really feel like a woman. And then for my kid to get sick, it was just, you know, it was like somebody had sucked the life out of me. Yeah. And I knew that I had to do everything I could to protect her. And so that's, that's when I put my armor on and went to work. <laughs> sorry <laughs> so yeah no i'm like oh my god but you I hate it when people ask that question because i'm like all right get the kleenex out here i go <laughs> well you i mean that's what you are you are an incredible yeah. mom and you just like took it to the nth degree and that's incredible <laughs> so how long after the diagnosis did you because you came home then started your facebook group started all that we're connected to these incredible people. Mm -hmm. How long until, how, how long was that process in researching cannabis before you started Canakit? It was, it was two weeks after her diagnosis. So we immediately, she was diagnosed on, was it Sunday? She was diagnosed on Sunday. It was June 23rd, 2013. I believe it was a Sunday. I'd have to go back. It was either Saturday mm -hmm. or Sunday. Pretty sure it was Sunday. And uh, so we went into the oncology ward on Monday. Within two weeks, I, I created her Facebook page, I think it was, you know, probably four or five days after uh, that Monday when we went and saw the oncologist. And then literally within, you know, a few days of that, we were connected to Ricky and Abby. And it wasn't even, you know, a full two weeks. Um, and then it took them another two weeks to get down to us with the medicine if my, if my memory serves. It was mm -hmm. all within 30 days. Everything happened within yeah. 30 days for us. So when we went to chemo and we were going to start that first infusion, I was on the phone with Abby oh, okay. while she was in Mexico with her family on a family vacation. And we had just started emailing back and forth within 48 hours of when Sophie was the first, supposed to get her first dose. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, look, Let's see if we can get the cannabis to work before you start the chemotherapy. So we went in and we spoke to her oncologist. And, and, and honestly, I, I didn't even speak to the oncologist first about it. I went and spoke to, um, I can't remember what the title is. It's the, the gentleman that's there. That's, that's, he's like the emotional support for oh, the okay. families. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of like the therapist that's. Mm -hmm. that's For the hospital. Yeah, well, yeah. It, for the floor, for the okay, oncology yeah. pediatric floor, because parents need somebody to talk to in these situations mm -hmm. that can be kind and loving and, and, and educational for you and, and help you have hope. Mm -hmm. Um, so my husband and I went in and talked to him and I was like, look, you know, I'm talking to Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein. They brought me this medicine. I, I, I want to try it. I want to do anything I can to keep my daughter from having chemo. And his mom had had cancer and she used cannabis mm -hmm. to help her eat and it saved her. Uh, just by smoking joints, he didn't even know about the oil mm -hmm. because it, it's not it like you could so just. New, yeah. It wasn't talked about on mm -hmm. the news back then. Sanjay Gupta, we call ourselves pre Sanjay. We mm -hmm. Sanjay Gupta wasn't even he wasn't even out about supporting this medicine for epilepsy yet. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen until February of the following year. Wow. So when I told um, this gentleman about this plant, he was like, "Well, it helped my mom, and I think the doctors here are very supportive and open minded." you should at least have a conversation with them. So my husband's out there with my child in his arms and they're about to stick the needle in her chest and give her her first round of chemo. And I'm like, stop. Wow. And um, the doctors are like, look, we don't know anything about this. We can tell you're a very educated person. We can see that you care about your baby. We, you know, this many, many, many families decide to do a watch and wait period during this time because these tumors Sometimes they don't grow anymore once they start. If the child has neurofibrom neurofibromatosis 1 or NF1, these tumors can actually regress. Oh. They can also spread more easily, mm -hmm. and they're also more aggressive potentially sometimes with NF1. And because we didn't have Sophie's blood study back yet on her genome, like what, what her uh, genomics were on this tumor, what the mutations were, we didn't know if she had NF1 or not. So we're mm -hmm. like, okay, let's, let's give it a couple months and do another scan because they grow slowly. And let's start on cannabis and see 
it, you know, what happens. And we started her on such a tiny dose because mm -hmm. nobody knew how to dose a kid. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know if we were using the right strain. Strain is very important when you're treating specific diseases. What our research in Israel has told us is that if you have pancreatic cancer and you find a strain that can kill that disease by 100%, that same strain may only kill a specific type of genetically mutated breast cancer by 15%, mm -hmm. or it may not kill it at all. Whoa. So it is very strain specific. So finding the right strain the first time was like Russian roulette. Like you, you, the chances of that, well, Russian roulette's a bad example because <laughs> that's, you know, you yeah. have higher numbers with that of something. You know. <laughs> but with this, it was, it, again, it was like a needle on the haystack. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a better analogy for it. And the strains are dependent on where it's uh, grown? It, no, it's, it's dependent on the plant and okay. the plant's genetics. So, and, and again, like if you grew a plant in California and you grew another plant in Michigan, there's going to be differences in the mm -hmm. profiles. They'll have a lot of similarities, but the percentages of the specific cannabinoids, terpenoids, flavonoids, like that all can shift depending on how much sunlight they're getting, how much water, what kind of nutrients you're oh using. Gosh. It's all so many variables. specific. Yeah. So it's all, there's a lot of variables. So we wanted to try it anyway. She wasn't in danger at all of mm -hmm. anything bad happening to her. So we waited two and a half months and we started her on cannabis and we titrated her up to a, to a low dose and her eye started to resolve, like the shaking oh. started to resolve. So we're like, we found it, we've done it, we've, we've cured her. <laughs> you know? yeah. We were so naive at that point. <laughs> um, and everybody was like very optimistic except for one doctor. And he's like, look, Tracy, I've seen this happen before. I've seen nystagmus resolve and the tumor actually get bigger. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. And unfortunately that's, what had happened mm -hmm. is her tumor hit another growth spurt, but it started growing towards the back of her brain. And so it pulled the tumor back a little and relieved some of the pressure on the optic nerve. And um, her tumor hit an incredible growth spurt. And it was at that time, they're like, look, she's gonna lose her vision. We need to do brain surgery. We need to take a, a biopsy from the tumor to see if it's a, a more terminal, more aggressive tumor. And her doctor told me on the phone that if it did, turn out to be more aggressive and it wasn't actually an optic pathway glioma that she wouldn't live to see her second birthday <gasps> on the phone uh so again in <sighs> knocked down to my very core I was getting ready for work I was sitting on the edge of the bed when he told me that the lights were off in the room I remember exactly what I was wearing and I called my husband up and I was like you got to come home and we've gotten another punch to the face so we increased her dose substantially and titrated her up daily little by little because your body builds an immunity mm -hmm. to the cannabis and the psychoactivity it doesn't like if you take uh, a five milligram dose today in a month if you continue continue to slowly titrate that up as your body grows accustomed to that dose you're not going to feel any more psychoactivity mm -hmm. at a 50 milligram dose as you do a five milligram dose if you work up slowly so we started working her up in preparation for chemo and preparation for brain surgery and again, this inoperable tumor. So they were only able to take the smallest amount of cells that pathology would allow in order to do a study on this tumor. Mm -hmm. So for seven hours, a big group of us waited in that waiting room for that little girl to go under the knife and to find out whether or not she was gonna live or die. Oh my and God. for seven hours, I sat there in the most physical excruciating pain of my life because of the tension that was in my body. Seven hour surgery for a tiny little baby who celebrated her first birthday recovering from that brain surgery in the hospital. Oh. Her first birthday was, she was bandages wrapped around her head and had just had brain surgery four days prior. Oh my gosh. So the doctor comes out and luckily he's like, it, everything looks low grade. We're you know really sure it's an optic pathway glioma. We have to wait for the study to come back, but there doesn't look like there was anything aggressive. And I mean, you've never seen such an eruption in that waiting room in your entire life. And we mm -hmm. were screaming. We forgot there were even other families in there. <laughs> totally forgot. And we all had our prayers for Sophie shirts on with her Facebook page on the back. Mm -hmm. And a gentleman in the waiting room actually messaged us from that day. And he was like, you know, we just want you to know how happy we are for your family. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. I will follow your story until it ends. And it was... Um, that's, you know, that it was at that point we're like, okay, the responsible thing to do is start chemotherapy. Let's combo these two together and let's yeah. see what we can do. And let's defy everything these doctors have told us is, is going to happen. And so we did. Wow. So w what are the benefits of the cannabinoids? If like, is it for pain? I mean, you've talked about obviously decreasing mm -hmm. the tumor, but what other things does that oh help my gosh. with? Yeah, so there's many. so many, but... 
so many wonderful benefits. Yeah. I mean, many, many scientists today have said that if this plant were discovered tomorrow and we'd never heard about it before, it would be seen as the most groundbreaking scientific discovery the world has ever seen because this one plant can treat so many different diseases and help with so many different issues in the human body. There's not another plant that's, that exists that's like it. It helps with pain, sleep, inflammation, anti-tumoral, anti-anxiety, um, uh, uh, analgesic, which is anti-pain, anti-inflammatory. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So for our child, not only do we believe and do her doctors believe and do the scientists that have studied her believe that it did in fact help shrink this tumor and has continued to help shrink the tumor throughout her roller coaster of a treatment plan. Um, we also know that it has helped her keep weight on. We can set a clock to when her appetite kicks in. If she's Right now she's on a clinical trial drug that's a, called a MEK inhibitor. Mm -hmm. It's not a chemo. It doesn't affect the blood counts. It doesn't, she, she threw up every day for like four months <gasps> and then her body adjusted to it Whoa. and she was fine. But she didn't throw up and get sick. She just yeah. threw up. And yeah. then she was fine. Unlike with chemo, you throw up, you feel really crappy. Um, you're low energy. You can't sleep well. I mean, when Sophie first started chemo, we would have to rotate days on, uh, like, I would sleep with her one night. Josh would sleep with her the next night. Then me, then him, then me, then him. Because she was waking up all night screaming and crying. The first three months were really, really hard. And we didn't see as many of the therapeutic benefits outside mm -hmm. of it helping to shrink the tumor in the first mm -hmm. three months. We did see that immediately. Yeah. Immediately we saw it helping to shrink the tumor to the point where the doctors were like surprised at what they were seeing. Um, but once she got off of that, that introductory phase where she was literally getting chemo once a week, every single week, it's called the induction phase. Mm -hmm. And she went on what's called maintenance where she would go um, for four weeks on two weeks off. It was then where we really started seeing these incredible benefits. And she was at higher doses by then as well. It was stimulating her appetite. It was helping her go to sleep. It was helping her take better naps. Mm -hmm. It was helping get rid of the pain. Her hair started growing it back immediately. Like that kid only lost her hair at that induction phase and didn't even lose it all. And she's never lost it again since. Wow. She's had even a full head of hair ever since. Now it's been thin mm -hmm. up until about, I'd say, a year ago. But she's always had hair. And when I say it's thin, it she just looked like she had thin hair. Just mm -hmm. like some girls have thin hair, some have thick. She just looked like she was a fine baby-haired blonde. Mm -hmm. It's not like you could see her scalp. She didn't have patches missing like most children um, that are on, like, more aggressive chemos. She looked great. And then when it comes came to any kind of recoveries from surgery, for example, she had um, uh, what's called a strabismus surgery. The, the tumor was making one eye go lazy. So mm -hmm. we went in and they had to clip the muscles and tighten them up to straighten it out well that you the eye is not supposed to be straight after the surgery for usually up to about six weeks it takes for it to actually straighten out and then there's gook that comes out of the eye because mm -hmm. they've just had surgery so Sophie actually woke up from surgery and her eye was perfect and stayed perfect and she never even had so much as an eye booger come out of her eye from wow. having both muscles cut on both side of her eyes. And when we went in and, and the doc we walked in the, like a couple of days later for the, the doctor to look at her, she was like, whoa, her eyes straight. And I was like, yeah, she woke <laughs> up with it straight. So that was like, uh, don't see that often. And then yeah. when she was like, well, how's the discharge been in her eye? And we're like, she's had zero. That's she's incredible. like, okay, it's, it's one thing if you see one of these things happen, which are rare, but for both of them, she was very caught off guard. And then Sophie's bone marrow. She had to have nine blood transfusions her first year on chemotherapy, nine. And one day, four months before she stopped needing, or before she stopped that first protocol, she stopped needing blood transfusions. That's medically impossible. When yeah. your bone marrow is that taxed and when you keep having to have blood mm -hmm. transfusions on that kind of frequency, your body isn't able to heal itself because it's yeah. still getting hit by the chemo every month or every, I'm sorry, every week. And the doctors are like, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan, we just wanted you to know that this is something that medically we can't explain. And we also want you to know that we are going to give cannabis the credit for repairing her bone marrow. Wow. That's yeah, a, that was that's a big incredible. one. Yeah. Every time I tell a room full of doctors that they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> and and then another thing that we have that that it's helped with her being on chemotherapy is that her last four months of chemo before she actually started this trial, her lab results stopped going up and down when she get hit with chemo. So 
with chemo, the reason you do four weeks on and two weeks off once you're in, um, in the maintenance phase is because your body has to have time to recover mm -hmm. because it knocks down your white blood cells. It kills your red blood cells. It, it, your immune system is attacked because chemo goes after good cells and bad cells. Mm -hmm. Well, it stopped it stopped affecting her good cells and was only affecting the bad ones. And the doctors are like, oh, did we reduce the dose? Did she miss some appointments? I'm like, nothing's changed at Whoa. all. So that was another big one where we're just like, wow, you know, like her immune system is in overdrive now on this medication, on this cannabis oil. And it, it has helped keep her healthy, happy. I mean, you'd meet this kid and you'd think that, she was just, I don't know, born with a microphone in her hand. She just takes over a room. She public <laughs> speaks with me on stages Aww. all over the country. And when I say she public speaks, yeah. she goes up and she talks like a four-year-old <laughs> would talk. But she struts up there. She was just on a stage in front of 800 people a couple of weeks ago at Patients Out of Time. And, I mean, it was uh, there may have even been more than that. It was a huge, huge, huge conference room, and the seats were full. And she had in personally invited half that room. She walked around that entire conference letting people what know what time she was going on stage Aww. on what day and asked them to not only come, but to bring their camera so they could take pictures of her. <laughs> that is so cute. The kid has no fear. And that's another thing that I think cannabis mm -hmm. has helped. It's incredible for PTSD. Mm -hmm. It helps block bad memories and nightmares. If I don't have my cannabis at night, I have nightmares. Yeah. Because I've been I'm through sure. a lot. Yeah. And I really think that that's another thing that's helped my daughter is helped her to have no fear because she doesn't remember the bad things. She mm -hmm. only remembers the good. And she's so outgoing that when she goes to the doctors, I mean, they're playing hide and seek with her. They're bringing her toys. I mean, Sophie's everybody's favorite patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's allowed her to really be herself and shine. And, and she, I, I ask her all the time. I'm like, baby, do you love your life? Are you happy? Mm -hmm. I ask her this all the time. And she's like, mama, I'm so happy. Aww. I love my life, mama. And for a child to be able to say that and for you to be able to believe them after what that kid's gone through, that's it's pretty miraculous. Yeah. yeah. So would you say that cannabinoids are act like as an adaptogen to what you need? Well, the way that the endocannabinoid system works, our, we have an endocannabinoid system in our body, which is the most intricate system in our body. And it helps regu regulate homeostasis or our body how it operates and mm -hmm. homeostasis means a perfect balance. Yeah. It helps keep our body in a perfect balance. So when there is something wrong in your body, if there's a deficiency somewhere, if there's something that's not functioning properly, the endocannabinoid system can recognize that. Mm -hmm. So what we see with um, you know fibromyalgia and migraines, which have been, that's only two of many indications that have been scientifically proven to be linked to an endocannabinoid deficiency, when you when your body's thrown out of whack and it in return is having a reaction like constant migraines or onset of fibromyalgia, when you in, ingest phytocannabinoids that almost identically match endocannabinoids, which mean inside and, mm -hmm. and that we produce, our endocannabinoid system produces, then you supplement that deficiency and it puts your body back into balance. Mm -hmm. So your body is able then to autocorrect what's wrong. Yeah. And with these cancers, they've got receptors on them as well. Mm -hmm. So the phytocannabinoids are able to attach to those receptors, fire up those receptors and in return cause apoptosis or cell suicide. Uh, oh my gosh. You know, so much <laughs> like how long did it take you before you went public? Uh -huh. I mean, you must've gone public before you started Canna Kids. I, or? I, not before I started the secret group, but mm -hmm. before I started the business. Yeah. Yeah. So then how long were you research or were you in research mode? Oh, since the day I found out yeah. about it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I don't yeah. know that there has been a single day go by in my life where I haven't read something about cannabis since my daughter was diagnosed you know, four years ago. That's amazing. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, uh, it definitely has been a lot of work. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you learn overnight. Mm -hmm. and, and I still only know a fraction mm -hmm. of what there is to know about this plant. But that's another reason why we built the website savingsophie.org. Yeah, it's our that. 501c3. Okay, if you so go to that's that, the 501 That's okay. the 501c3. That's our, that's our nonprofit mm -hmm. that we have. Um, we do fundraisers with that. We, um, it's an educational platform. 
Canna Kids and Saving Sophie, they partner up to do a lot of big events. Mm-hmm. And, and for those people who want a tax deductible donation, that's why we set that up as a 501c3 so we could attract bigger donors mm-hmm. and we could give them t- that tax write off. And then for that money that we get in through that organization, we just write checks directly to the patients. We've recently helped uh, a mom pay her rent. We helped them put food on the table. We helped a mom get her car fixed. Um, there's a lot of things that our families need other than just oils. They need money to survive. Yeah. So when our family families are in that state of total despair and we've got money in the savings Sophie account where we can just write them a check to their electric company or to their for their car payment or to their landlord mm-hmm. we'll just write those checks out um, but you know the reason for bringing that up is on saving Sophie we actually have a whole section called cannabis studies so okay. every time I come across a study that is a cancer driven study we pop it on that website and mm-hmm. we summarize it Okay. So we make it very digestible and that way it's, it's easier to find those studies or those articles or, you know, documentation on how this plant works and why, or new discoveries that have been found or story of a patient that's mm-hmm. ha- found success. Um, then you can go in and kind of pick and choose what you do and don't want to learn about. We're also building an uh, autism and epilepsy component to the cannabis study section right now, oh. which we hope to be releasing hopefully in the next six months or less. Cool. So I'm trying to help other people get yeah. as educated as me. So Canna Kids are the, like, is the, the difference line. is the product line yeah. is Canna Kids and yeah. then Saving Sophie is the nonprofit. Right. So you started Saving Sophie first. We started them at the exact same time. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, got we, it. I started designing, because uh, that's what I did before I got into Canna Kids. I owned a media agency and oh. we designed and built very large websites. We did okay. social media management, marketing, graphic design for like IBM, Paramount, Samsung, okay. some, some big companies out yeah. there, small ones too. Mm-hmm. But I've been a graphic designer for over 20 years of my life. Mm-hmm. So when I um, started Canna Kids and started, you know, I got that. Uh, the friend of mine that was gave me my first little round of startup money to build the grow with and. Uh, when all that started and all those negotiations started happening when we started building the grow, it was at that time that I was like, okay, we also need this supportive tool for our families as well, because it's not just about understanding what the oil can do. It's not a silver bullet, not yet. Anyway, Mm -hmm. there's this whole life approach that you have to take to this. So we wanted them to have a resource area where they could go to where they could get information quickly that we'd vetted that we believe to be good, solid information. Yeah. So they didn't have to spend the hundreds of hours that my husband and I did looking for the right answer. Sorting so it's got, yeah. it's not just cannabis studies, it's cancer trials, mm-hmm. um, or clinical trials, cancer definitions, non-carcinogenic products for the home, um, food and uh, diet and nutrition, um, uh, uh, additional types of, of therapies that you can take. Uh, holistic therapies is the, the title of it that you can take, you know, would be, whether it be mushrooms or vitamin C infusions or what have you, there's all kinds of other things yeah. that you can do to help keep your body strong. And we really want our families to take this overall wellness approach. Mm-hmm. Listen to your doctors, make sure you study what your doctors are telling you to do. Mm-hmm. So you can make sure that's the best decision and you don't need to go in there and fight for a better one. And then also feed your body and, and treat it like a temple and then edu- educate yourself on cannabis. So you know what it is that you're giving and why it works. So you can feel good about that as well, because it's all about not only just treating yourself well, but feeling well. Yeah. And if you're depressed and you're sad and you're down and, and you feel hopeless and you you're scared all the time, then that's going to affect you. And, Parents sometimes end up getting cancer because the stress and the depression from their own child having cancer destroys them so, so badly that Mm -hmm. they tear up their immune system and they end up with a disease. One of the little girls that went to clinic with my daughter, her mom ended up getting breast cancer after going through two and a half years of leukemia treatments with her own daughter. Within a year, she had cancer herself. Now, whether or not it was related or she was genetically predisposed, Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that it didn't. It didn't play into that in some yeah. way. Wow. So tell us a little bit about the political landscape and how oh that boy. was like when you started. <laughs> Obviously, it's such a controversial issue. And also with, with the health care system. Yeah. So got a lot of opinions on health care. Yeah. I'll try not to share too many of them. <laughs> share them all. <laughs> um, well, you know, th- things have definitely changed since when we started four years ago. I was being warned by a lot of people back mm-hmm. then. Don't go public about what you're doing. Don't call your company can of kids. Don't try and treat children. They're going to come for you. They're going to come for your kid. They're going to shut you down. Bad approach. And I'm like, no, it's not a bad approach. This is, I, I've, I've 
had a lot of instinctual, mm -hmm. intuitive moments that have happened to me where I felt like I was having a path kind of laid in front of me. Mm -hmm. And when Sophie got sick, I, I, I said, I was like, all right, God, <laughs> talking to you, listen up. Mm -hmm. If you'll help me figure out what I need to do with my child, if you lay those stones before me, I'll walk the path and I'll make sure everybody know that you put that path there for yeah. me. Just help me figure this out. And I became much more religious at mm -hmm. that point. I've always been religious, but I became much more religious at that point um, than I previously was. Cause I really, I really needed to find that yeah. and to have to cling to that. So it was a very different landscape than, than it is today. Um, there wasn't anybody really talking about kids. We were very much hiding from everyone up until literally two weeks before Sanjay Gupta came out. It was only because her doctor said we now are giving cannabis the credit for the shrinkage that we're seeing yeah. that we felt comfortable coming out about it. So the, the, the legal landscape has definitely evolved and changed. We are, we, I don't want to say we're a lot safer now today than we were four years ago. We were a lot safer last year than we are yeah. today because oh. Obama wasn't going to come after mm -hmm. moms and babies that are dying. And, you know, California was legal and now we're like fully legal. And, you know, the, the financial, um, uh, endowments were being taken from the federal government in order to come after people like us and, and throw us into jail because we were selling this as a medicine. So the, the landscape has now taken another shift. Yeah. Uh, another very big shift. And now we've got Jeff Sessions, who's our attorney general out there saying that, you know, good people don't smoke cannabis. And I'm here to tell you, I'm a damn good person. <laughs> I mean, I say my prayers every night. I pay my taxes. I help save dying children and adults. I mean, we mm -hmm. treat just as many adults as we do kids. I've dedicated my life to serving these families. I've dedicated my life to my child. I'm a good person. I don't, I don't hurt people. And yeah. I, I never give advice that I feel could ever ever hurt another human being and now we've got this man who you know grew up in a time where cannabis was looked at as this horrible drug um he was uh, definitely stigmatized on what this plan is and for whatever reason he either has done the research and just thinks it's all false and thinks it's all a bunch of garbage or something else is going on i it's i don't get it to be honest with you, I just cannot wrap my head around it. When Sanjay Gupta, who was the medical director to the White House, is on the news going, this plant is amazing. It's saving lives. I take back everything negative I've ever said. I'm watching these children heal with my own eyes. It needs to be decriminalized. Yeah. And the attorney general isn't listening to him or to anyone else around the world. And our president isn't listening to him or to anyone else around the world and countries all around the globe are going fully legal yeah. and doing research. I mean, look at Israel. I mean, that's why I went to Israel. That's why Canada kids and cure pharmaceutical has now partnered and we're funding the Technion Institute's next four years of cancer research. Our press release just came out last week. Yeah, I saw that. And you know, for, for these groundbreaking discoveries to mm -hmm. be happening where we're seeing in Preclinical mouse trials in a laboratory, we're seeing disease being eradicated oh from these God. animals using cannabinoids alone. And our attorney general and our president won't take notice of that. It's all about money and power. Yeah. Yeah. Just like gun control, mm -hmm. you know, just like healthcare. I mean, there's yeah. all these, uh, I don't know. If I sat here and told you that I was fearless about what was going to happen over the next four years, I'd be lying to you. Because um, whereas there were multiple statements that were made both behind closed doors and to the public that they weren't going to come after medical, but they do reserve the right to go after recreational. And when the budget bill was passed, I think it was a couple weeks ago now, yeah. and Trump left it in there that he reserved the right to come after both, that's, you know, I, I thought I was safe. I was like, okay, you know, if they go after recreational, that's going to be awful because I have so many people that I love and admire in the recreational industry yeah. that feed their families with that money, that put their kids through school with that money, that pay their medical insurance, their doctor's bills. And if that job's taken from them, it's going to destroy their family. Mm -hmm. Like that was hard for me because I don't really believe in competition. I believe in collaboration. I yeah. think the more products we can have in the market, the the better 
they're gonna we're all gonna push each other to be better we're yeah. all gonna push each other to go further we're all gonna push each other to to get the answers in a much more timely fashion than if there's one brand yeah and just spread and the word and bring exactly. the awareness i mean yeah. everybody's making discoveries yeah. every time they treat a patient so um, I would never want to see the recreational market go away for that simple fact that I, mm -hmm. I have a lot of people I really love in that market, but I thought, okay, well, that'll be bad, but at least I'm safe and at least I can take care of my child and at least I can have insurance and, um, I can employ these people that I love. So, I mean, I love my staff, mm -hmm. <laughs> love my staff and they love me. It's just yeah. like this wonderful family and, you know, they have people they take care of. Um, and when that came out, I was not only shocked, but I was appalled. And I am going to do everything I can as an advocate and as a voice in this community to fight the injustices that could potentially be handed down to people that I love and care about and people that I don't even know but still care about because they're, they care about this plant. Is it legal across all 50 states medically no. legal? No. No. So 28. Oh. Yeah. So we still have some states that have not come on board, but there are a lot that are coming on board. There's, um, if, my, if my numbers are right, there's 28 states legal for medical and eight states and dc that are legal for recreational mm -hmm. so there's 28 and 9 i believe that's that's pretty accurate um but there's you know there's a lot i think texas is going to come on pretty soon and you know there's other people tennessee i'm working with people in tennessee to try and get legislation passed that's where i'm from originally so um you know so you're Florida's working trying to on legislation yeah to try and get, okay well i i'm a voice for those mm -hmm. communities uh, i've got a group that's uh, wanting to fly me out to speak to one of their senators in another state that um, they're probably going to bring me out in like September. They're going to fly me out, put me up so I can sit in front of their their senator and, and speak with him and tell him about our experiences and show him our research and and try and get these guys on board as well. So uh, every state's pushing for it. I don't yeah. know of a state that isn't because every state has people dying in it. Yeah. Children, adults, elderly. And they and they're this medicine can help them all. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we are we're getting there though and yeah. it's a matter of time before they all come on come online and talking about the medicine i went through and looked at the cannabis um Canna kids product line mm -hmm. and i am just so amazed at how clean the products are oh, and i just you. wanted to talk about that because i think a lot of times um i don't know what it is maybe people don't aren't aware of the harsh chemicals that they're putting in these products oh there were yeah there were some are aware, <laughs> most are aware but some maybe they just ha don't have the education behind it but for someone like you i'm just curious because also you just like we're talking about how you were feeding um sophie avocado and mm -hmm. pureed food that you had personally made her and so i'm just wondering is that a practice that you had in your life before you even had Sophie that you were super healthy and clean and sourcing ingredients or I'm from Tennessee girl <laughs> I grew up on fried chicken and mashed potatoes yeah. no not because at all because you're using like MCT oil mm -hmm. it's sugar-free yep vegan and olive oil vegan yep. yeah yeah olive oil is used in the extraction process or is it CO for THCA yeah yeah. Olive oil is, is what we use to extract the cannabinoids and terpenoids and flavonoids from the flower for the THCA, since that's our non uh, that that's how we process it. It's it's another yeah. production method for our CBD and our THC. We use a CO two extraction, which doesn't use a solvent, and we double and sometimes triple lab test those oils just to make sure they are as clean as the driven snow. I mean, you know, when Sophie got sick, that's where I mean, I ate great. And, and did a wonderful job of, you know, doing a lot of walking and mm -hmm. staying positive. And I had a wonderful pregnancy, but I, I can't sit here and tell you that I ate all organic the whole time because, you know, six years ago that when I got pregnant, yeah. that it wasn't that big of a thing. It wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. yeah we didn't really think about it. And plus, you know, organic foods like so expensive and mm -hmm. I, the grocery store across the street had a very, very small selection. The simple truth wasn't even out yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> simple truth is everywhere. I mean, that's, that's an organic brand you can get at all the major grocery stores yeah. in huge sections now, yeah. but it wasn't a thing. I did eat healthy and I was exercising three days a week with a personal trainer right before I got pregnant with Sophie. And so I was on meal delivery and I was eating, I was watching, you know, my carbs and my sugar intake and all that. So when I got pregnant, I had a, I, my body was in the best shape of its life much better shape than what i'm in now <laughs> and um and then when she got sick i'm like okay it's now time to do everything i can to support her immune system and putting pesticides into a weak body is not a smart idea yeah. putting solvents like ethanol or butane um into a sick body is not a good idea 
It's just not. And yeah. putting stuff into a body that has sugar or carcinogens when it's already taxed and weakened, mm -hmm. also not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So when Sophie got well, I was like, okay, we're going to switch to organic. This, I, I was already... I already by that time had Sophie on all organic products anyway, because mm -hmm. by then it was becoming a much bigger deal about, um, you know, the pesticides that were in the plants and the GMOs. And I was like, okay, we're not feeding her any corn. Yeah. <laughs> no GMO products. Yeah. I'm going to make all of her baby food from scratch, which I did all of her baby food, her, her entire childhood. I made from scratch Aww. using organic products and uh, fruits and vegetables and, and meats. And um, so I was already treating her like her body was already being treated as a temple mm -hmm. mine not so much but hers <laughs> uh well I take that back because I was I was breastfeeding so I was eating a lot cleaner than than maybe I do now I, I still am pretty healthy but um I I don't not every meal that I eat is organic at least one meal a day that I yeah. eat is or actually at least two meals that I eat a day are organic my lunch is a little bit harder to get mm -hmm. organic but my breakfast and my dinner are organic um, so, but, but no, it's not a practice I grew up with in Tennessee, in the town that I grew up <laughs> in, which had one red light growing up and it now has two. They, to this day, don't have organic <laughs> to this oh day. God. Are you serious? They do not have organic. So when we go, we have to just be like, all right, well, you know, yeah. she's going to get what she gets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you have um, to let it go. It, it's a practice that I've adapted through Sophie, mm -hmm. you know, being born and knowing that this little girl needed to have a much healthier diet than I did. Um, and once she got sick, it was about continuing in that ritual and that routine. And then when it came to treating, you know, patients and, and um, creating these medicines, I, I treat these kids and these adults as, as if they're my family. Like mm -hmm. when I look at a patient, when a patient comes to us and they're like, we need help. I treat them like I'm treating another family member. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful relationships with our patients. I have had to distance myself a little bit from uh, working individual. Well, actually, I have, I've had to distance myself a lot from working with the patients individually every day because I'm, I'm just sure, yeah. on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm in meetings all day, every day. But I have a team of patient coordinators that are the most incredible people. Mm. And they they take these pictures of these patients and they put them up on the wall. We're actually going to build a wall um, uh, and put all of our patients in picture frames oh. and call it the wall of hope. Oh. And um, yeah. And they've got these pictures all over their, uh, all over the lab so they mm -hmm. can look up and remember every day if they're having a bad day, why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I would never give somebody that I love and care about something that's bad for them. Yeah. So we've adapted um, this very clean medicine production process and we refuse to put anything into the market that's even marginally tox uh, has any kind of toxicity in it. I really appreciate that because it's it's really important. It and is. It's amazing to see companies doing that. Yeah. So my last question for you is you just have so much going on and that you've just been go, go, go for yeah. so long. And I'm just curious how um, how you refuel and recharge and what sorts of practices you have for your self-care that, you know, maybe you can share with us. Well, <laughs> it's funny because I don't have a lot of time to yeah. do the things that I should do for myself. But I'll tell you the thing that that really is my refuel, my recharge that gets me through life is every night when I lay down with my daughter, she still sleeps in the bed with us because she does have uh, mild seizures. She hasn't had one in months and months and months and months. Mm -hmm. We've got them really under control. But as she grows and gets bigger, yeah, her medicine will need to be titrated up because of her weight gain. Mm -hmm. And so she could have a seizure or she could throw up. Um, she, she doesn't really get sick anymore, but she could. Mm -hmm. So I kind of use that as my excuse to keep her in the bed with yeah. me because I've always been a big snuggle bunny. I love mm -hmm. snuggling. And when I lay there with her at night and she is just wrapped around me and I am wrapped around her, I breathe her in. Aww. I breathe her in and I thank God for her. And I just allow myself to be present with her and I allow myself to be grateful and I allow myself to not fear the worst. And I, I just remind myself that the worst is over and there's only good to come. And as long as I can keep her healthy and I can keep her happy and I can keep her next to me, that's all that matters in the world. And I think a lot of people go through life and they forget to be present and they forget to smell the roses. We all do. Mm -hmm. I, I was guilty of it for years. I forgot to stop and smell the roses and mm -hmm. really, truly appreciate what I have. Because I can tell you, 
it can always be worse. Mm -hmm. Even for me. Oh my God, are you kidding? If you saw what some of these families go through and, and we've had, we've, we, we lose patients. We don't save them all. And a lot of them get to us way late in their treatment. And a lot of them are just have extremely aggressive disease that just won't respond to anything. Or they have a terminal cancer that even cannabis can't get rid of. It just helps with life extension. I'm telling you, it can always be worse. So if there's any advice that I can give to anyone, it's to A, not be so hard on yourself and to cut yourself some slack. Yeah. B, don't sweat the small stuff because the, sw the small stuff doesn't matter. You're not going to remember that small stuff in a year from now. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change you. It's not going to change your life. It's not going to devastate you. It's not going to keep you from breathing the air that you breathe. And B, you know, really be present in those moments. Be present with your children. Be present with your family. Be present with your friends. Be there for each other. Support each other. And remember to breathe in those really special moments and hold on to them because we as humans have a tendency to hold on to what's bad and when we hold on to the bad too much it blocks us from seeing the good that's right mm -hmm. in front of us oh my gosh well thank you so much <laughs> i just want to take a moment to thank you for your your presence and your dedication and your hope and i'm so I just feel so blessed to have met you. Aww, thank you. That's so sweet. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me. And he thank you for helping me get the word out because that's really what it's all about is advocating. Yeah, of course. Anything. Thank you. Uh -huh. No problem.